Hi, I'm Jeffrey. Welcome back to Nightfalls. Come, settle in for tonight's calming meditation and soothing bedtime story. As always, don't worry if you fall asleep before the end. You can drift off whenever you're ready. Before we begin, I'd like to thank you for the kind reviews. I wanted to shout out 44 Karen in particular, who says she uses nightfalls to chill and relax each day, as well as at bedtime. Thanks, Karen. I'm so happy to hear we're bringing some calm into your day, as well as your night. Come, take a pew beside the fire tonight as we join Sir Edmund Hillary on his journey to become the first person to reach the summit of Mount Everest. Here, surrounded by the hills and mountains of nightfalls, I'm often struck by the sense of smallness we feel when presented with the sheer scale of our world, being towered over by rocky cliffs. I can only imagine the sense of calm brought about when standing in the shadow of Mount Everest. And I'd like to experience it for myself one day. But tonight, Let's let Sir Edmund Hillary do the talking. Before we join Sir Hillary on his first rigorous steps towards the world's highest peaks, let's take a moment to relax. Come to a comfortable position and allow your eyes to gently drift closed on the day. Focus your attention on the sound of my voice as you let your breath drop in and pay attention to the way it drifts in through your nose and out through your mouth. As you lie there breathing, allow yourself to find stillness for perhaps the first time all day. You're as still and unmoving as the mountains that rise up from the Himalayas. As silent as the night sky, as peaceful as a summer's evening. Inhaling, know that this is your time to breathe, to simply be and exhale. Without the chaos of daily life to distract you, you finally have time to check in on how you're feeling to nurture your mind and body and grant yourself the time and space you deserve to relax. Draw a deep breath in, welcoming the need for sleep into your body and allowing it to linger in your muscles and settle in your bones. As you exhale, let go of the day, let go of any distraction, and give yourself over to the weight of exhaustion as tonight's tale begins. It was late morning on the 29th of May, 
1953, when Edmund Hillary and his Sherpa colleague, Tenzing Norgay, reached the summit of the world's highest mountain, Mount Everest. They were the first people to do so. They shook hands and embraced each other warmly. It had been a huge achievement to scale the famous mountain. It was 29,032 feet high. But they had climbed it one step at a time. They looked at their surroundings and took in the breathtaking panoramic view of the snowy mountains below them. Thick, white clouds rested between the mountain peaks, and the earth curved gently on the snowy horizon. Edmund Hillary's fascination with mountaineering had begun at a young age, and so had his love of adventure. Born on July 20th, 1919, in Auckland, New Zealand, Edmund was a small and shy child who loved getting lost in his adventure books. He filled his head with dreams of the exciting journeys that he might take one day. During his teenage years, a long train commute to school gave Edmund even more time to read his adventure books. They instilled in him a love of the outdoors, and he imagined himself having adventures around the world and going on enthralling expeditions. Although small at a young age, Edmund soon shot up in height and grew to a height of over six feet. He took up boxing, which increased his strength and endurance. During his time at school, he soon realized he preferred after-school activities to the formal lessons given inside classrooms. He loved being outside and participating in activities. It was during his high school days that he first began climbing New Zealand's Southern Alps. In 1939, he completed his first climb and reached the summit of Mount Olivier. It was a steep mountain of 6,342 feet, nestled in the Sealy Range, overlooking Auraki, or Mount Cook, New Zealand's highest peak. He made friends with other climbing enthusiasts during those early years, and joined forces with some of them to complete climbs of other mountains later on. Edmund particularly loved the challenge of climbing snowy terrains during the winter. His father and brother had a beekeeping business, and Edmund helped them with it. It was an ideal summer occupation for Edmund, leaving the winter months free for him to concentrate on his climbing activities. In 1951, Edmund became part of a British reconnaissance expedition to Mount Everest. This led to him being invited to their next climbing attempt of the mountain. Like many people, Edmund was determined to scale the magnificent mountain 
but it would take a few more years before he completed his successful climb. Climbing Mount Everest was something every mountaineer dreamed about. The mountain had first been officially measured in the 1850s and was named after the surveyor who was involved at the time, George Everest. Though the mountain lies on the border between Nepal and Tibet, there was a time when it was only accessible from the Tibetan northern side. Using this northern route, many mountaineers set forth on their quest to climb the mountain, but no one had succeeded. And Mount Everest remained a challenge yet to be conquered. A dream yet to be realized. In later years, Nepal was open to tourists, and this meant the south side of the mountain was now accessible to climbers. An earlier series of aerial photographs had shown a possible route to the top via the south side. And so, the race to reach the summit using the new route began. Teams of climbers started their journeys via the south side, but came across obstacles along the way. With determination and ingenuity, the obstacles were overcome. Thanks to their resilience, the adventurers were able to ascend Mount Everest further and further with each renewed attempt. Yet, despite their perseverance, one obstacle proved insurmountable and caused all climbers to admit defeat and turn around. The obstacle was a huge crevasse made of ice. It seemed impossible to pass. The climbers who had tried knew a solution would be found one day, and adventurers would eventually be able to surpass the icy crevasse. But how and when remained a mystery. But not for long. climbing team from Switzerland were given permission to climb Mount Everest by the Nepalese government. The Swiss team employed local guides to assist them on the expedition. One of the guides was a man called Tenzing Norgay. He was an experienced guide and had worked with other climbing expeditions over the years. Tenzing had grown up with an ever-present view of Everest in his sight, and his dream was to climb it one day. So impressed were the Swiss team with his experience and helpful demeanour that they asked Tenzing to become a full member of the climbing team. And so, the Swiss expedition set off on their ascension of the Great Mountain. Eventually, they reached the huge ice crevasse that had caused an end to all previous attempts to climb the mountain. It was an imposing sight. One of the leaders of the team noticed a small ledge on the opposite side of the ice wall. Using his ingenuity and a large amount of courage, he managed to manoeuvre himself onto the ledge. A simple rope bridge was then constructed across the gap. This new bridge allowed everyone else to cross the crevasse. Once they had passed over it, the team ventured upwards. 
the summit of Mount Everest was now closer than ever in their sight. But it wasn't to be. Just 800 feet from the top, they had trouble with their equipment. Try as they might, the issue couldn't be solved there on the mountain face. They were forced to turn back. It was a successful mission nonetheless. The team had made it higher than anyone who came before and had opened up a way for those who would follow. One day soon, they knew someone would finally reach the summit. The next party to attempt to climb was a British team. Amongst them was a man from New Zealand, Edmund Hillary. Being a friendly and easygoing man, with a wealth of climbing experience, he was a welcome addition to the team. In preparation for the ascent, the British team secured the best climbing equipment they could find including clothing and supplies. Great attention was given to even the smallest of items to ensure they would aid the climbers on their way. Their aim was to be the best prepared team possible and to climb further than anyone else. They took into account all of the lessons learned from the previous mountaineers who had attempted the climb. The British team arrived in Nepal in March 1953. They were led by Colonel John Hunt. It was in Nepal that someone else joined their team. Tenzing Norgay. Just as the Swiss team had been impressed with Tenzing's skills, so would other climbing teams and the British were delighted to have him on board. As for Tenzing, it was another step closer to making his dream of climbing Mount Everest come true. A group of porters were hired to assist the team, and together they set off on the arduous journey towards the majestic mountain. By mid-April, they reached the base of Mount Everest and set up camp. A journalist joined them and advised there was a surge of interest in England surrounding their attempt to climb Mount Everest, as it coincided with Queen Elizabeth's coronation year. Hopes were high back home that Everest would be conquered in the same year as the coronation. The British team knew their present attempt would be their only chance to be the first to reach the summit. If they didn't succeed, other climbing teams surely would. In early May, the leader, John Hunt, gave his team details of the men who had been chosen as the ones to make the final part of the journey towards the summit. And if they weren't successful, the next men in line were to be Edmund Hillary and Tenzing Norgay. The team began their climb. At many points they were surrounded by towers of ice that would groan and creak in the cold wind. Blankets of thick white clouds rolled over the landscape, making it a challenge to see the difference between a cloud and a snow-covered mountain. Aluminium ladders were used to cross the ice crevasse that had previously been impossible to negotiate. Sometimes, people at the front of the expedition had to cut steps into the ice to allow safe passage for those who were walking behind them. 
time was of the essence. Not only due to their drive to have successfully completed the expedition before anyone else. May was monsoon month, and they had to act quickly whilst the conditions were still good. During the monsoon season, weather could easily change, and that would seriously hamper climbing conditions. Expeditions in the past had been cancelled because of the monsoons. During the journey up the mountain, Edmund Hillary and Tenzing got to know each other better. Soon, a friendship based on trust and mutual respect was firmly established between them. When the team had climbed high enough, a base camp was set up. Some of the team were to stop there, whilst a smaller team were given the task of completing the final leg of the journey. This smaller team would undertake the uncharted path that would lead them to the summit of Mount Everest. The small team set off on the final part of the route, hope in their hearts. Their comrades looked on from below. They also felt hopeful as they watched their colleagues getting smaller and smaller the higher they climbed. But once again, it was not meant to be, and the team were defeated. A mixture of equipment failure and other factors caused the small team to admit they couldn't go on. They turned around and headed back to base camp. It was time to call in the reserves. Edmund Hillary and Tenzing Norgay. Early in the morning on May 28th, the two men set off from base camp with a small support party to assist them. The constant wind that had been present for days dropped, making climbing conditions easier. Despite this slight respite, the thought of the approaching monsoon season was an incentive for the men to proceed without delay. On the way up the mountain, they passed by a tent that had been left behind by the Swiss team on their attempt to scale Everest. Further along, they collected oxygen canisters left by their fellow teammates a few days earlier. The oxygen in the tanks would prove invaluable later on. Upwards, they climbed. Soon it was time for the support party to return to base camp. Edmund and Tenzing were now on their own. They set up a tent on the cliff face and settled down for the night. They would head towards the summit, bright and early the next day. When they woke up the next morning, the wind was calm and the sky was blue, ideal weather conditions for the two mountaineers to continue on their journey. Edmund led the way up the south summit. Having the extra oxygen left by their teammates was a great bonus that helped tremendously with their journey. From base camp, their team watched the tiny figures on the snowy mountain making their way ever upwards towards the summit. At nine o'clock, they reached the south summit. There were only 300 feet to the top, but one last obstacle barred the way. An obstacle that no one had ever faced before. A huge rock loomed in front of Edmund and Tenzing. It looked impossible to climb. 
with his years of climbing experience, Edmund scrutinised the rock and tried to work out a way to overcome this final obstacle. He noticed a small crack in the rock. It looked to him like a chimney, and it ran to the top of the stone face. Not knowing if it would work or not, Edmund squeezed himself into the chimney opening, and through a series of wriggles, he managed to work his way to the top. Once there, he pulled the rope taut and helped tensing up. To this day, this section of rock, which stands at nearly 29,000 feet high, is known as the Hillary Step. Edmund and Tenzing walked along the ridge, getting ever closer to the top. The mountain ridge flattened out. A few more steps. And then... They reached the top of the world. The two friends gazed in wonder at the panoramic view of the surrounding mountains. They had made it. They shook hands, hugged, and smiled warmly at each other. It had been a dream come true for both of them. Dreams that started when they were boys. Edmund and Tenzing stayed a while at the top of Mount Everest. They had a 360-degree panoramic view of the mountains laid out at their feet. Surrounding them were some of the largest mountains in the world. There they stood, looking down upon them from the summit of Everest. Rising above the cloud... The snow and ice reflected the sun and took on some of the blue of the sky. Jagged, craggy peaks were softened by blankets of snow and the lightest, translucent tufts of cloud that laid upon their summits. The treacherous icy crevasses, insurmountable rock walls, and countless obstacles that they had passed or navigated around on their way seemed imperceptible from up here. They had made it. They were viewing the world from an angle no person had before perceived. And it was glorious. Tenzing buried some items in the snow some sweets and a pencil given to him by his daughter. Edmund buried a small wooden cross the team leader, John Hunt, had given to him. Photographs were taken from all sides, and Edmund took a photo of Tenzing. He declined to have one taken of himself, They took one last look around and then made their way back to base camp where they received a rapturous round of applause from their ecstatic colleagues. Through a series of telegrams the news reached London and was announced via a loudspeaker to the waiting crowds who had lined the streets to see Queen Elizabeth go by in her carriage. Hearing the amazing news on a day of celebration made the climb even more special to people in England. The press called it a coronation gift to the Queen. When Edmund arrived in England some time later, he was given a hero's welcome. 
In his home country, Tenzing was also given a warm welcome in recognition of his achievement. Thanks to their determination and years of mountaineering experience, Edmund and Tenzing had made it to the top of Mount Everest. Their success carved out a path for fellow climbers, who then proceeded to also reach the summit of the world's tallest mountain. Edmund and his teammates knew that climbing Mount Everest would not have been possible without the invaluable help and support of the courageous people of Nepal. During his time with them, Edmund had grown fond of the people living in this mountainous region, and he felt compelled to give something back to them in recognition of their help. He set up the Himalayan Trust, which helped provide money for the building of schools and hospitals in the area. He was also responsible for the construction of airstrips and bridges too. The Himalayan Trust is still active today and continues to fund education and healthcare for the people of Nepal. Just like in Edmund Hillary's time, climbers who travel to Nepal continue to support the people who live there. After climbing Everest, Edmund continued to have other adventures. As well as climbing the famous mountain, he also completed journeys to the North and South Poles as well. Many people have since followed in his footsteps in an adventure that is known as the Three Poles Challenge. In 1977, he led the first jet boat expedition up the Ganges River. One of his most notable adventures was accompanying Neil Armstrong in a small twin-engine plane over the Arctic Ocean before landing at the North Pole. This took place in 1985, and in 2007, Edmund journeyed to the Antarctic to commemorate the anniversary of the founding of Scott Base. Edmund scaled other mountains in the Himalayas on further visits, but climbing wasn't the only kind of mission he took part in. He once led a team to search for the fabled abominable snowman. Despite a thorough investigation, Edmund concluded that the creature did not exist. Throughout his life, he was recognised for his achievements. On the 6th of June 1953, Edmund was appointed Knight Commander of the Order of the British Empire. In the same year, he received the Queen Elizabeth II Coronation Medal. From 1985 to 1988, Edmund served as New Zealand's High Commissioner to India, Nepal, and Bangladesh. In 1987, Edmund was the fourth appointee to the Order of New Zealand. Other awards include the Polar Medal, Knight Companion of the Most Noble Order of the Garter, and the Padma Vibhushan. To mark the 50th anniversary of the Scent of Everest, the Nepalese government gave Edmund honorary citizenship. He was the only foreign national to receive that honour. Since 1992, Edmund's portrait has been on the $5 note of New Zealand. When he gave permission for his image to be used, Edmund insisted the backdrop be an image of New Zealand's highest peak. Mount Cook, rather than Mount Everest. Many streets and institutions around the world are named after him. Edmund's determination and bravery are an inspiration to thousands of would-be adventurers everywhere. Edmund appeared on many television shows, 
and his humility at what he'd achieved was clear to everyone who met him. He wrote books about his adventures, High Adventure and The View from the Summit. Edmund Hillary loved the outdoors and the adventures that awaited him. He did whatever he could to ensure young people would be able to experience the outdoors in a way he had, and he set up a New Zealand charity to make that possible. Sir Edmund Hillary Outdoor Pursuit Centre. As for Tenzing Norgay, in the years following his triumphant climb to Everest's highest peak, he continued to contribute to the field of mountaineering in India and beyond. On the 4th of November 1954, the Himalayan Mountaineering Institute of Darjeeling was founded in tribute to his achievements. Tenzing was appointed as chief instructor and spent the next 20 years directing field training there, contributing enormously to the expansion and development of the field. He took part in countless other expeditions across the globe, from Tibet to Antarctica, and he wrote two best-selling books chronicling his adventures. Tenzing Norgay remained a hero in India and Nepal, and across the world for the rest of his life. Edmund Hillary was famous for saying, People do not decide to become extraordinary. They decide to accomplish extraordinary things. Both of these men seem to live by these words. Edmund Hillary and Tenzing Norgay are still inspirations to many people. When they saw a challenge, they would set forth to achieve it, armed with a strong belief in themselves. Like all challenges, Mount Everest was conquered, one step at a time. <laughs>